Welcome class to chapter seven, which is the normal distribution and z-scores, where we get to learn about z-scores. Uh, the first uh, part of the chapter goes over the statistical test decision flowchart, and it looks pretty overwhelming, but what you wanna know is that um, in the next upcoming chapters, you're gonna learn a lot about this, and you'll know it like the back of your hand, hopefully. And um, it's really uh, cool in the sense that once you learn this, a lot of su success in statistics is learning about the logic of statistics and why you do the things that you do, but it's also learning about what tests to use in what instance. And um, the cool thing about statistics is once you learn what tests to use in what instance, you're gonna be really successful in a large area of statistics as well as understanding the logic behind it. And the, um, this flow chart right here gives you uh, what tests to use in what instance. And it may look overwhelming now, but in the upcoming chapters, um, they'll review it, we'll review it together. And um, what mainly this chapter has to do with is this little piece right here, which is the one sample Z test. Actually, it refers to at the end of the chapter, but that's what we'll be covering in the next couple chapters. Oh, um, one more thing. Um, it talks about means, um, comparing means or testing relationships at the top right here in the flowchart. I like to think that's fine, but I like to think of it more as, uh, are you running an experimental study or a correlational study? If you're running an experimental study, then you go to this area where you're going to use t-tests and uh, ANOVA and such like that. And if you're doing a correlational study, which remember doesn't stu uh, cannot study causation, but studies relationships and how they vary or co-vary with one another, then um, you'll use these tests over here, which are the Pearson uh, chi-square and stuff like that. what I want to say about that one. The next section of the text uh, is inferential statistics. And um, that's basically how we use data to test hypothesis and answer research questions. The basic logic will rely on concepts that we have already discussed, um, including probabilities, sample distribution of means, uh, standard deviation, and the mean. And you'll be able to answer the question, are the results that we see, for example, for the caffeine study, due to chance occurrence, for example, sampling error, or are they due to an actual relationship between the two variables? Is there a relationship between caffeine and memory such that it improved uh, people's memory or scores on a memory test? And what it, you'll be using are tests for significance to answer that question. And um, you'll be able to answer the question, what is the probability that what we think is a relationship between two variables is really just a chance occurrence. Um, and if it's a very low probability that's a chance occurrence, then we can conclude with a certain amount of confidence that there is a relationship between the variables and that we did not get our results based on chance. So that's in an inferential statistics in a nutshell. Help me, oh, I'm in a nutshell. Okay, kicking the dead horse on that one, Matt. Um, so the next uh, book, or the next part of the text talks about uh, z-scores and it's really a great introduction to inferential statistics and the logic behind uh, inferential statistics. A z-score is of course a standardized score that indicates the location of a score within the population distribution. Um, the book talks about the research question and the example of do online quizzes help students uh, perform better on a test uh, versus on the test that the instructor gives versus past students who did not have the online quiz option. So the instructor is looking to see if this online quiz is going to help the students. Scores in the past classes, uh, the instructor uses the population and the mean is 75 and the standard deviation for the population is three here. And the current class mean is 82. So it looks like at face value that they did well. And we wanna know, was that due to chance occurrence, sampling error? Or was that due to the online quizzes? Really, that's the crux of the question right here. And that's the crux of the question that inferential statistics really answers, um, or tries to answer. Uh, the statistical question is the, is the 82 a significantly higher score than the population mean of 75, kind of like what I was saying, showing that online quizzes helped raise exam scores? Or did these scores occur by chance? Has nothing to do with the online quizzes. And a z-score will help you to determine the answer to this question and state with a certain amount of surety, with a certain amount of confidence, that the obtained score was due to the online quizzes. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of methodological problems with the study in the book. 
um, that we won't go into, including lack of random assignment, but just pretend for this instance that uh, the experiment was well designed. And so this gives you kind of a visual of uh, the population mean right here, the sample mean, which is 82. And as you can see, um, the uh, standard deviation was three, I believe. So one standard deviation would take you to 75 plus three is 78. And then two standard deviations would take you to 81. So as you can see, the sample mean is more than two standard deviations above the mean, which is pretty cool in terms of your research question, as I'm going to show you in a little bit. So the book then talks about the z-score transformation, and it talks about transforming data to z-scores, provides a way of locating the score in the standardized distribution, um, and it certainly can be useful to compare two scores that come from two populate, different populations, and that's really the beauty of standardization, right? You have two different uh, measurements, right, for standards for, for example, you know, your dog weight and uh, human weight, and you can compare those two things using a z-score, right, standardizing the scores. And then you can compare, for example, your dog's weight compared to the average weight for a dog versus your weight compared to the average weight for a human, and then you can see who weighs more, relatively speaking, you or your dog. Quit eating the homework, Fido, right? That's what's going on here. Um, the Z tests, uh, useful and also useful in hypothesis testing. And really this is your primer for hypothesis testing, which I think is very cool because um, it sort of helps you really understand hypothesis testing pretty easily. But um, it's useful in hypothesis testing to compare the means of two groups when the population standard deviation is known. And so you remember from the flow chart, that was really the one of the crux of the matter why you would use the Z test over the T test, I believe. And in any case, here's that same graph. The Z score is a value that represents the distance of a score from the population mean in terms of standard deviations. So this is one standard deviation from the mean and two standard deviations from the mean in the positive side and vice versa this way. The sign of the score, positive or negative, tells us whether the score is either above or below the population mean. The mean of the score of the z-score distribution will always be zero, and the z-score represents the distance from the mean. The standard deviation will always be one. Um, the transformed scores will be in standard deviation units once they are converted, kind of like I was talking about. One standard deviation, two standard deviations. And in the example of the back when the exam, it was three standard deviations. So it was, uh, remember 75 to 78 was one and then 78 to 81 was two, and then the online quiz people got 82. Woo -woo. So uh, you've already seen me just do it in my head, right? Calculating the z-score by hand, but this is the way it goes. So you find the population mean and the st uh, population standard deviation. So population mean here and population standard deviation. So you got those values, whoop, whoop, right? And then you've got your online quiz scores, right? Okay. So then you calculate the difference between the score and the population mean, and then divide the difference by the population standard deviation, which I'm going to show you right here with those. Lo and behold, there we have it, 82 minus 75, which is the population mean, and divided by the standard deviation gives you 2.33, right? Above two standard deviations above the mean. And what that means is that the current class mean is 2.33 standard deviations above the mean, and we can determine the likelihood of getting uh, scores above or below 2.33. And excellent, great. How do we do this though? Uh, we use the Z table in your book is in Appendix B, for example. And uh, before we review how to use the Z table though, let's look at the idea of a normal distribution as the use of the Z table to compare the sample mean to the population mean really critically rests on the idea that both data come from a normal distribution because you're really making some assumptions and that's the main assumption there. So segue or segui into the, as I like to try to remember it because it's such a funny spelling, right? S-E-G-U-E. -E. Um, the normal distribution, the normal distribution is a symmetrical distribution where the percentage of scores in each proportion of the distribution is known and these are really critical areas for you to remember. 
Um, I remember it as 34, 14, and 2, um, not as exact as the 34, 13.6, 2.2, but, uh, but that's just easy, a little easier for me to remember. So it's 34, 14, 2, you know, I think of the year 34, 14, or I don't know, something like that. But it's kind of cool to remember these things because then you can remember, like, for example, what two standard deviations from the mean is, which is... Uh, pretty good for uh, data. In any case, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yeah, there's the percentage of scores in each portion of the distribution, and pretty important to know. Percentage of scores that fall uh, in each part of the distribution for the segments, it's marked by the standard deviation is already known. Um, so you can say basically that 68% of the scores uh, fall within one standard deviation of the mean, and how did I get that? It's 34 plus 34 together, so you can say within one standard deviation of the mean plus or minus standard deviation, that there's 68% of the scores. 95% of the scores fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So you can see where the online quizzes falls. It's a very rare score, and that's what I'm kind of getting at, this whole z-score is getting at, right? Is how rare is it in terms of a score compared to the population? And if it's extremely rare, you can make some kind of uh, decisions or uh, judgments about that, that it's the fact that it's so rare must be that it's meaningful. So recall the previous example where we got the z-score of 2.33. It means that the current class mean is 2.33 uh, standard deviations above the mean, and we can determine the likelihood of getting a score above or below 2.33, which you can see is a very unlikely score. So it probably rests uh, like 0 0.006, or it's less than 1% is the, um, the number of scores that are above that. And the number of scores um, that are below that are quite significant, 99%. Locating a z-score in the normal distribution is what we're gonna talk about next. And the unit normal table is in the appendix B. Um, that's basically another name for a z-table. Unit normal table can help us determine the likelihood of a range of scores in the normal distribution when we want to know how likely it is that we would obtain a z-score at or above or below a specific value. And so I'm going to basically show you how to uh, use this unit normal table here. And I have an example of it right here. Unit normal table, table the proportion of scores in normal distribution for many different z-score values. And so um, in this example, I wanna show you first uh, the two uh, z-score of two right here. And as you can see, that is plus two standard deviation. So it's right here. And as you can see, um, if you look at the body, it says that 98% of the scores are what? Right here. So that's B, the body. You can see right here, it says 97.9778, but essentially 98%, right? So that's the body. And as you can see visually, if you look right here, 98% of the scores, yeah, it looks like it's right there. And then, and I like to plot it on a visual so you can really get a sense of the numbers. It helps me at least, so I recommend that if you're having trouble with getting a sense of the numbers in this table here. And then if you look at the tail, which is going to be here, that looks like a tail, right? Versus the body, yeah, it does. That there's only 2% of the scores or 2.2% right here. So um, that's kind of just how to read um, the uh, Z table, unit normal table. Um, why did I highlight the 1.96? It's really a magic number for statistics because oftentimes you're looking at a probability of 5% and this is going advanced into, I'm just kind of, you don't need to know this now, but I'm just kind of prepping you for um, the future chapters. But um, so then why would you ask, is it 0, 0.0 or two and a half percent? Um, well, usually, usually you're looking for uh, a change and you have to uh, address if it's going to be a change this way or this way. So um, long story short, you'd be looking for 1.96 or above, and that's like a magic number for statistics to say like, oh yeah, there's like a, you know, a pretty darn good probability that I did not get my results based on chance, um, but I got them based on that this is significantly different. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, uh, I'll explain it in the next couple chapters. 
Um, the negative scores um, in the unit normal table, it's important to pay attention to the sign of the z-score. For example, a negative 0.20 z-score means that approximately 98% <coughs> are above the score, which is the body. So now you have, instead of a positive 0.20, you have a negative 0.20, right? Which is right here. So now the body, which is right here, means that 98% of the scores are above as opposed to below, right? So it's just a way of framing it differently. The book didn't really describe it that well, but if you look at the graph and kind of think of it, it describes it really easily, right? Negative point, uh, negative 2.0 z-score means that 2%, 2.2% of the scores are going to be below that. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, and then if we look at uh, using the normal distribution to determine the probability of a sample mean, um, the distribution of sample means will be useful to determine the probability of a sample mean. In the final exam example that they gave, there were 30 students in the sample. So if you can imagine for a moment the theoretical distribution of sample means, right, which consists of all possible samples of 30 students, boom, 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 from the population, right? So imagine that. And so basically you could say, how likely is it that we would get a mean score of 82 or higher in the population of means for courses without online quizzes? And it's a very unlikely score. That, that's an extreme score, right? In all of the distribution of sample means, you know, that we would expect, it is not found. If I were to pick out all of those randomly and keep picking them out, right? The probability of me finding that score of 82 is very low just based on chance alone. Yes, it will be there in the distribution of all sample means, right? And we can tell where what the probability is of getting a score one standard deviation above, two standard deviations above two, right? That's the whole logic of this, right? But the, the probability of getting that score of Z of, uh, of 2.33 is extremely low, and so um, that's something to note, right? So this is an extremely unlikely score from the set of all possible um, exam means from this course. This tells us there's a very low chance that the mean score of 82 came from what I like, I like to call the status quo of the population, and that is the population without online quizzes, okay? So that's the default, if you will, or the status quo. Um, because it's a very uncommon score for this distribution, right? If we are just looking at people without online, online quizzes, um, yeah, and we pulled that sample out of 30 people out of all the distribution of samples, it would be very, very low probability that we would find them. In fact, it would be one out of 100, like, right? Or less than that. So um, it's a very uncommon score for this distribution. And so the logic goes, if the score, um, is this unlikely to come from the distribution of all sample means for this population, then we can reject the idea that this set of students came from the status quo of the population. Thus, tests without online exams, right? And we can say with a certain amount of confidence that this group of students did not come from the status quo of the population. They are different, right? They're different. They did, there's a very low chance that they came from the status quo of the population, and they are different. And this is not due to chance. Remember, it's a low percentage of chance, but rather due to the effect of the online quizzes. Let's see. And that is the essence of the logic behind hypothesis testing and the inferential statistics, such as the one sample Z test that we will be learning about in the next two chapters. And so hopefully that was a nice intro to learning about uh, z-scores and normal distribution and the logic behind that and the logic hopefully uh, behind understanding a little bit of the logic behind uh, z-tests and inferential tests that you'll be doing in the upcoming chapters.